Hey, hello, everyone, and welcome to the kickoff webinar for the 2025 Student Steel Bridge Competition. My name is Christy Sattler, and I am the University Education Manager here at AISC, and I'm so excited that you're here. Um, I'm joined with two special guests, and we um, are looking forward to talking through what's going to happen this year and giving you an overview of the rules changes. So hopefully you've had a chance to at least download the rules and get things started, and then um, like I said, we'll kind of walk through things and go from there. So as I mentioned, I'm joined by two, two very special guests. Um, first of all, Jason McCormick is the chair of the SSBC Rules Committee. Um, he's also the Arthur F. Thurnau Professor of Civil and, and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan, where he has taught and conducted research on steel structures for over 15 years. And he has served as the chair of the Student Steel Bridge Competition Rules Committee since June of 2018. And then Javier Moncada is the SSBC National Head Judge. He is a professional engineer and works as a Senior Associate and Construction Project, project Manager for the City of Lake Oswego. He was involved with SSBC for three years while in college and has been the Regional Head Judge in the Pacific Northwest since 2013. And he has been the National Head Judge since the 2023 competition season. So a warm welcome to them both. They'll be uh, filling you in on, on the bulk of the, the content in today's webinar. So here's just a brief agenda of what we will cover today. Uh, first, just an overview, um, an introduction, some announcements, and then Javier will give an overview of the competition. I know we have some folks here in the audience who may be new to the competition. So uh, we'll walk through just the general flow of the competition and the different elements um, once, you, once you arrive at your regional competition. And then uh, we'll turn it over to Jason, who will go over the rules changes for 2025. And then uh, at the end, we'll, we'll cap it all off with some additional team resources to support you in your design and planning and fabrication for this year. And then at the end, we will take questions. So any questions that you have can be asked in the Q&A feature here in Zoom. So you can type in your question at any point during the presentation and we'll see those. And then we will um, go through those at the end of the webinar as time allows. Um, I do want to remind you that there are no rules questions here. So if you have a specific question about the rules, um, you can submit that directly to the rules committee um, on the rules and clarifications page at AISC.org slash SSBC. So um, just no, no specific rules questions today. And then this webinar is being recorded and we will post it on the webinars page um, on the SSBC website. So you can view it later if some of your teammates aren't here and they want to check it out, you can give them that link. And then I would like to acknowledge the generous support of our sponsors. So these, a, these program sponsors um, financially support our overall program um, and help fund things like the participation stipend that all of you get for participating in a regional competition, um, as well as the standardized equipment so that each region has the same, same type of equipment. So this is our list of our, of our current sponsors for the 2025 season. And then we will go ahead and do a, just a brief polling question, um, just to get a feel for how many, um, you know, different people are on the call today. So the, hopefully you can all see the the question, but the question is, how would you describe your experience with the Student Steel Bridge competition? So are you a pro, someone who participated last year or the years prior? Maybe you've had some previous involvement and you're looking to get more involved. Um, maybe some of you are all new. And then I'm sure there's maybe some faculty advisors. So whether you're a seasoned faculty advisor or a new faculty advisor, and then we know we have some SSBC super fans. So maybe you're not participating this year, but I uh, just want to check things out. So I'll give you just a couple more seconds to get your answers in. Um, again, just out of curiosity to see who's, who's in our audience today. All right, I'll go ahead and end the poll. Let's take a look at the results. And so it looks like we've got almost half of our audience here is, is pretty experienced in the competition. Um, got a good portion of newbies too, so um, to, again, to all of you, we're very excited that you're here to join us and, and are interested in the competition for this year. All right, so 
We maintain a website at AISC.org backslash SSBC, and this is going to be um, a great spot for you to access uh, a lot of the most update, up-to-date information. So all the team resources, the rules themselves, um, some information about the regional competitions, um, and you know you can also ask your any rules questions on the website. So the best way to navigate those pages is with this left-hand navigation bar. Um, the rules page is probably going to be a, a great spot for you to be spending a lot of time. That's where you can download the rules. And then we will post the official clarifications on that page. And there's also the link to submit a question to the rules committee. And then that team resources tab, we'll talk through several of the resources that are on that page so you know what to find there. Um, but again, it's just a, a handy navigation tool as you're um, sifting through all the information that we provide. And then here's a map of where all of the regional competitions will take place next spring. So there are 20 regional competitions um, scattered across North or across the United States um, with their locations here. And then the national finals will take place at Iowa State University um, the weekend after Memorial Day. And then for any of you who are in the Mid-Atlantic West and Mid-Atlantic East, um, those are being held at the same location, but still two separate regional competitions. All right, so then at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it, things over to Javier, who will give an overview of the competition. So Javier, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christy. Also, thank you to all the participants that are calling in today. We're all really excited for the 2025 Steelbridge competition this year. Next slide. Every regional national conference is different, but all should include these critical elements. Please follow up with your host university about uh, their mailers for information about time, place, and schedule of conference uh, and about these elements. Um, next slide. Aesthetics are is when bridges are being built and, and they're displayed location as intended. These bridges, uh, these are all the bridges that are in the competition. Here's a picture of one of the national bridges a few years ago. And on the right is some pictures from our regional competition. These are the bridges that are all set up at the same time. So students, faculties, friends, families, volunteers can walk around and look and admire all the beautiful steel bridges. Judges are also taking notes and scoring the bridge per section 6.2. 2.1. Posters are also set up so spectators can read about your bridge analysis, design, sustainability practices, and see your sponsors. Uh, this is always done before construction, but sometimes it's done in either the morning before construction or can be done the day before. Again, uh, check with your host university and their mailers. Sometimes aesthetics can be done outside. That's very weather dependent. Uh, little Javier pro tip. This is a great opportunity to uh, see the competition and see bridges, take an opportunity to see what uh, ingenuity is out there uh, and take pictures and get ideas for future bridges. Next slide. Construction. I like to think of it as three subtasks, uh, three subphases. Uh, Pre-construction is when the bridges are disassembled in the staging yard at the end of each construction lane. Uh, designated areas are for the steel members, the tools, bolts and nuts only, and bridge builders. Once done uh, with the layout, the bridges are um, inspected by the judges and they perform a, a check they do a checklist measuring individual prefabricated components. Uh, they use pre-made wooden templates, magnets, tape measures. Uh, check that bolts have not been, modif have been modified. Mm -hmm. If components are too big, judges will speak with the captain and demonstrate size and type of, of violation. These pre-construction violations, if your bridge has any, will add uh, penalty weight. Uh, next slide, please. Here are some pictures from uh, a, a regional conference last year. Um, 
you know, these components sometimes, this is the pre-manufactured template box on the left. Sometimes they don't, they don't go in one way, you have to kind of turn them around, but um, in the spirit of the conference, the competition, uh, they should fit in the box. This one particularly had to go in diagonally. Um, in the background of the picture on the left, you can see some very colorful steel near the tools and hammers. Then uh, this is an assembled tool, and uh, that's why it's in this designated tool area. A little bit more information on that uh, in future slides. Um, sl picture on the right, uh, shout out to Starbucks. But also these are the rigid containers that this particular team used to house the uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, this is a relatively new rule, no more nuts and bolts uh, on the ground. Um, <clears throat> these rigid containers are considered tools and they also need to meet the tool requirements for size and measurements and type um, that are outlined in the rules. Next slide, please. After pre-construction, after pre-construction checks are done and bridge builders are in the designated start positions, captains will start time. Builders are assembling the bridge. Crowd cheers. Ah! Honestly, this is one of my favorite parts when the bridges are being built. Builders are moving back and forth from the staging yard across the transportation zone and starting their build, their bridge build. Typically, they start with their uh, with their footing, as seen on the picture here on the left. Judges are tracking that builders are not stepping out of bounds and items, if any, are falling on the ground. Items like the bridge components, other than the footings, uh, if people are, if the tools are touching the ground or nuts or bolts are being dropped. Uh, I've seen bridges built on asphalt parking lots, plastic turf, carpet, wooden floors and concrete. Sometimes the flooring needs plywood. So these are all local conditions. Uh, if the judges see something unsafe during construction, then they, they will stop time. Uh, you are encouraged to look at the floor and, and if you have any concerns before construction to point those out. Uh, next slide, please. Action shots. Um, builders are designated as either uh, builders or barges. This particular picture was from last year's nationals. And uh, I want you to notice that the first box here shows uh, a temporary tool that's being used. Uh, it looks like it was partially assembled um, during construction time, but it's used to, to hoist up the bridge. Uh, you can also see it again in the middle box. Looks like maybe it's touching the ground or it's gotten close to touching the ground, which is why the judge uh, is pointing at it. Uh, the builders on her on their on their knees, and that is okay. This is not a penalty. They're in they're in their designated build area. Uh, looks like she's uh, partially supported with her weight, and that's okay. Thank you, next slide. Here's another action shot. Builders are required to wear PPE safety gear, hard hats, safety glasses, closed toed shoes. Uh, this particular team chose to wear additional protective gear like um, knee guards and, and gloves. Gloves are only required to wear during load testing, but uh, if they want to do more PPE, that's that's totally acceptable as well. Uh, next slide. This particular team does not have a barge. Again, these are rules. These are pictures from last year's national conference. And um, they're able to assemble their bridge accordingly without, uh, without any barges. That decision of how you distinguish the builders uh, is, is really up to each individual team. Next slide, please. 
this team also doesn't have any barges, but I did want to point out that the judges are watching. We're, we're tracking time, and we're also tracking to see where, where you're stepping or not stepping. It looks like this team is just about done, and uh, that the judge is really leaning in and, and making sure that they're not uh, stepping in, into the designated water area. Once construction is done and time is stopped, um, the judges will do their post-construction checks. They use pre-made templates and tape measures and magnets. They're checking for functionality and ensuring that the bridges are within the dimensional tolerance. Um, they're looking for connection types, any gaps in assembly. They're checking connection safety, like if any welds broke during construction, and if any connections are missing bolts or nuts. Any dimensional tolerance violations will add penalty weight to the bridge. Picture of uh, John Peruski, our, our previous head judge but judges are allowed to touch your bridge while inspecting connections and while taking measurements. Uh, they're, they're gingerly about it and uh, they're just doing uh, their tasks. After the post-construction inspections, the lane judge will go over the findings with the captain and, uh, dis and, and discuss any repair options and, and those protocols. All right, that ends construction. Now time to move the bridge from the construction lanes into the uh, load area. The first load area is the lateral loading. Uh, bridges are moved into the, ladder, into the lateral load test stations. Grates and 75 pounds of angle steel is applied to the top of the bridge. A pulley system is set up and attached to the bridge along with a laser, which measures sway when the 50 pound pull load is added. Judges will give instructions on how to restrain the bridge from sliding. Um, this is not last year's, this is last year's um, target. Um, spoiler alert, uh, targets are changing this year. Uh, Jason will, will go over that in more information, but this is last year's target. Next slide. After lateral loading, which is a pass-fail test, we move into vertical loading. A total of 2,500 pounds is added into two designated areas on top of the bridge. And depending if it's a regional or, or national conference, the deflection is measured in two different ways. This particular picture is the nationals from la um, nationals from a few years ago. We use string pots that are attached to the to the grate as close as possible to the designated area, and we have a data acquisition system that's hardwired to a nearby computer that has proprietary software used to track deflection. Next picture. <clears throat> Most of the regionals use these standardized, uh, beautiful red steel um, mechanical calipers. Uh, they're attached on a chain. Um, oftentimes, you really can't attach it to the bridge too closely, but we can't exactly attach it to the bridge, so we attach it closely to the grate nearby. Um, the picture on the left shows a bridge that's actually uh, failed and buckling in the center portion of it. And um, you kind of see that there's some jacks. They're about four inches below the grate. These jacks uh, catch the weight. Uh, and that way there's no catastrophic, oh, thank you. <laughs> there's no catastrophic uh, spilling of steel. Um, it's really taken for, we use this for safety measures. After after loading the bridges, the bridges moved into the the bridge weight. This is 
um, just digital scales that are used and at each footing, uh, four scales are used. After the bridge weight, the bridges are moved off the floor and they're disassembled. Um, you know, this, this is sort of a train system, so a lot of these bridges are moving through. So we ask that they're moved off the floor and uh, disassembled and they're either outside or in the designated area. Oftentimes students and, um, and volunteers and, and people that are supporting the team take pictures of the bridge before it's disassembled. It's a really great opportunity to do so. After the competition, um, all the scores are tallied up and uh, there's an award ceremony or banquet and there's several different awards. Um, aesthetics, speed, bridge that was built the fastest uh, with any time penalties that were added. Lightness, the, the lightest bridge, total weight, which includes also any penalties from dimensional violations. Stiffness will be uh, the bridge that deflects the least. Uh, construction economy, factor of how many builders and, and the total time taken. Structural efficiency, the total weight and, and the deflection. And the overall is the sum of construction economy and structural efficiency. Cost estimation is, uh, prior, and I'll go into it in a little bit more detail, but uh, cost estimation is the overall difference between how much you think your bridge is gonna cost and how much it actually costs during performance. That's the absolute value. It's it's submitted um, prior to any construction starting. Video awards, and at the national level, there's a few special awards, uh, team engagement award, a most improved team award, a spare to the competition award, and the ingenuity award. Next slide. A few other key topics, uh, cost estimation uh, as outlined in section 6.2.8. It's due before the die roll. It's always easiest just to submit it at the, uh, the captain's meeting, but check in with your host university to see when, that, to see when that's due. Uh, this year, spoiler alert, number two, there are 11 load cases. Something that's also critical is the captain's meeting. It designates who the captain is uh, for each team, uh, the head judge has an opportunity, the regional head judge or national head judge has an opportunity to clarify um, any last minute rules and go over the, the competition condition and schedule. And there's also a Q&A at the end. The die roll, C table 7.1, uh, it'll determine the locations of the decking um, and the deflection devices and where we're monitoring sway. Should be done before the first bridge build and no bridge modifications are allowed after the roll. Uh, scoring, there's a scorecard that follows your bridge throughout every station, and uh, the captain will sign off at each station. Um, the official scorecard will come out on our, on our website uh, in, in a few months before the first competition. Uh, it also provides uh, rankings for, uh, for the awards, award ceremony. Uh, there's this whole section on appeals in section 15. I won't get too deep in those details, but if you disagree with one of the judges' calls uh, at any of the phases, then uh, you have the right to appeal. And, and um, so take a look at that section that's, uh, that shows how to follow that protocol. And now I'll hand it off to Jason. Hi, right, thanks Javier. And thanks uh, Christy before. And hopefully everybody is excited for this competition and welcome all those of you that are listening to this. So now we want to focus on some of the major changes to the 2025 rules compared to 2024. Keep in mind, though, that this webinar doesn't replace going through the rules in its entirety because there are smaller changes within the rules that you should get by reading through it that you won't get from this webinar itself. Next slide, please. So as always, we create the rules to accommodate a variety of design choices. So we encourage you to think outside the box, but do make sure all your members fit in the box. The new challenge this year deals with the configuration of the bridge. So there's asymmetry due to the staggered piers on the east end 
of the bridge. And this is going to introduce some torsion into the bridges that you're going to have to take into account with your designs. There's also some increased construction restrictions due to the island in the middle of the construction zone and the two separate river segments. And we've also are encouraging uh, more thought about lateral stability and the role it plays in terms of the vertical loading and stability during vertical loading. And we'll talk a little more about that in regards to how that plays into the uh, lateral load test. There are some revised poster requirements that I encourage you to look over. They're fairly minor, but there are some changes there. We've minimized disqualifications like we did last year. So if you fail the vertical load test, it's just a large penalty at this point. The bridge isn't disqualified. And then due to the fact that we have the two different uh, river segments, you can have up to four barges that are allowed for construction. Next slide, please. So the, the problem statement that you're dealing with and the reason for your design of the bridge is looking at the Skunk River water trail and the need to connect some of the trails within the Peterson Park system on either side of the river. Now, the place, the location where we wanna put the bridge has a protected island where there's uh, flowers and and some wildlife there that we want to protect. So you're not going to be allowed to uh, utilize that island during construction. Likewise, you're not going to be able to use any permanent or temporary piers within the river or elsewhere in the construction site. So the only place that the bridge can actually touch the ground will be in the footing locations. And as always, we're looking for a one-tenth scale model. Next slide, please. So here you can see this year's construction site. Note that the construction zone is 22 feet, six inches long. You can see within that there's a five foot construction zone on the west side and a four foot, six inch construction zone on the right side. Then we have two four foot rivers and a five foot restricted island in the middle. The barges must remain in the river segment that they were initially in at the start of construction and will not leave that river segment throughout time construction. And also the biggest thing to note is the staggered uh, piers on the east side of that uh, site. Next slide, please. So if we look at um, the details here, you can see the staging yard detail a little more clearly. Not much has changed with this as compared to uh, last year. The only difference here is the builder segments only two feet wide instead of three feet wide. That was largely just to help out host schools who were having space constraints. Um, if you look at the construction zone detail and island and river detail, you can see a little um, closer the actual construction zone. So these are the locations where um, construction has to take place on land. The big thing to note here is that you have that stagger on the east side that's two foot six inches. This is probably the largest stagger that we've had in any of our uh, bridge competition, co competitions to date. So that'll be something that you're going to need to take into account with your designs. Next slide, please. Because of that stagger, we've created a plan view bridge envelope. So this is looking down on the bridge from above and it essentially shows you the envelope of the bridge. So the bridge can't extend past that diagonal line on the east side. That's the major difference from, from last year. So you need to keep that in account. And that will also mean that you have some asymmetry in terms of the bridge. So the the north side stringer is going to be between 15 feet, 6 inches and 16 feet, 6 inches, whereas the south side stringer will be between 19 feet and 20 feet long. Next slide, please. Here you can see the elevation view bridge envelope. So this is looking at it from uh, the, looking at the south side elevation. So that's why you see a length of 20 feet. If you're looking at it from the north side, the bridge envelope would only be 16 feet, six inches. Now, the key things to notice here is that the clearance this year under the bridge is seven inches. The maximum height of the bridge is three feet. So still you're not looking at significant over trusses in terms of your design. And then you see that stagger on the right side, that two foot, six inch uh, stagger between the footing locations. Next slide, please. 
And then looking at just some cross sections uh, through the bridge envelope, if you look at the far left there, the section A, where the footings are for the west end, you can see that directly above the footings, you're allowed to have the bridge. But in between the footings, you still need to maintain that seven inch clearance. And then if you're at the center of the bridge, you need the seven inch clearance completely under the bridge itself. Next slide, please. And on the top of the bridge, we have a bridge passageway requirement, right? This is to allow the um, pedestrians, bicycles, service vehicles to utilize the bridge. In order to check that, we use the stringer template that you see there. It's held vertically in the top of the rabbits that you see here, the notches need to be in contact with the top of the stringer the whole time along the length of the bridge, except after you go past the east um, pier or east footing on the uh, north side. In that case, as you continue along, it will only be in contact with the south side stringer because the north side stringer would have terminated. Next slide, please. These two rules, rules 9.3.9 and 9.3.10, haven't changed, but we get a lot of questions in regards to these often. So what we're talking about here, if you're looking at rule 9.3.9, it's dealing with splits, protrusions, abrupt changes in height along the top of the stringer within a member. So if you're looking at a specific member where the stringer is located on the top of that member, in between the ends of the member, you can't have any splits, protrusions, or abrupt changes in height along the top of that, that stringer. Whereas 9.3.10 deals with between two members that make up the top of the stringer. And it sets some maximum horizontal separation and elevation change between the tops of adjacent members. And that's a lot, usually, we allow some, some flexibility there, largely because there may be some fabrication errors and it's hard to get really that precise when connecting the two different members. Next slide, please. For connections, there's really been no change in the connection requirements other than the fact that they've been moved to subsection 9.5. And you can take a look at the connection safety examples document that that's either been posted or will be posted shortly. For examples of legal and illegal connections, it tends to be pretty helpful if you're trying to figure out whether a connection that you're looking at meets the requirements of subsection 9.5 or not. The major change on the connection side of things is how we're doing connection inspections and how the connection requirements, if they're not met, are penalized. So the way connection inspection is gonna work, this is now in subsection 9.4. The judges will inspect the bridge after um, time construction is finished and they'll look for a connection safety violation, so violations of subsection 9.5. Any violation they note, they'll mark with a piece of tape. The builders will be able to see, once the judges have finished this inspection, the builders will be able to see the connections that the judges have marked, and they'll also be able to um, review the bridge for two minutes and identify any additional connections that they feel need to be repaired. These will also be marked with a piece of tape. So after that two minutes, all the connections that are marked with a piece of tape will be penalized one minute for each individual connection. And then the builders will be given five minutes to be able to repair these identified uh, connections that need to be repaired or need to be changed to meet the connection safety requirements. But no more further penalties will be uh, placed at that point. The only thing here is if the builders are not able to complete the repairs or the necessary repairs in that five minutes and the judges deem the bridge not safe for um, vertical or lateral loading, then the bridge may be removed from competition, but that's a safety thing more than anything. Next slide, please. Here you can see the construction site. Um, the major change here is you have the restricted island in the mill, so you're not allowed to enter that island unless you're trying to retrieve something as a result of an accident. The barges need to stay in the river segment that they started with, as I mentioned before, and you can have up to four barges, and the barges start and end in those orange dock areas. Next slide, please. 
For load testing, this is the same rule as last year, but it's always good to reiterate from a safety standpoint. So team members participating in load testing must wear steel toe or composite toe shoes that extend above the ankle or steel or composite toe caps over leather work boots. This is largely for a safety concerns in case there's a collapse so that if an angle were to fall on someone's foot um, or part of the bridge to fall on someone's foot, their foot would be protected. Next slide, please. As far as the lateral loading goes, the general procedure is gonna be the same, right? It's gonna be pulled from the south side with a 50 pound lateral force. The location is gonna be based on the dice roll where S will either be seven feet measured from the west end along the north side stringer or eight feet, six inches from the west end along the north side, swing, uh, north side stringer. As with previously, this way must not exceed three quarters of an inch. If it exceeds three quarters of an inch, the uh, bridge will not be eligible for vertical loading for safety concerns. But we have added um, some additional criteria for the, the lateral loading. If the bridge is able to keep its sway under half an inch, there's a benefit that, that will be given that you'll see when we talk about the, um, uh, the equations at the end. Next slide, please. As far as the vertical loading, the major change here is we're using two dice uh, to come up with the load cases. So instead of the normal six load cases, we actually have 11 load cases. Uh, this year. Uh, D1 and D2 are the same measurement location. So D1 will always be on the north side of the L1 grate and D2 will be, always be measured on the south side of the L2 grate and sway will always be measured on the south side of the L1 grate. But note, if you look at that table there, L1 and L2 aren't necessarily, L1 is not necessarily always on the left of L2, right? They can swap in this case. So uh, this provides a few more low cases that you have to worry about in terms of uh, the design of your bridge. L1 is always going to contain 1,400 pounds and L2 is always going to contain 1,100 pounds. Next slide, please. As far as the vertical loading goes, loading is going to be stopped if sway exceeds three quarters of an inch at any point. If any measured deflection at D1 or D2 exceeds three inches downward, if the decking or any part of the bridge comes to bear on a safety support or floor, although the judges have some leeway in terms of how they'll deal with that situation if it were to come up. If a decking unit or some load falls off the bridge, then it will be loading will be stopped. If the bridge collapses or in the judge's opinion is in danger of imminent collapse, loading will stop and if the bridge collapsed during unloading. So not only does the bridge have to be loaded, it needs to be unloaded um, as well. So these are largely safety concerns, the reasons why vertical loading would be stopped, but the bridge won't be disqualified. What will be done is five inches will be input for D1 and for D2, and a $20 million penalty will be added to the structural efficiency score. Now, even if the bridge is not stopped, if any measured deflection at D1 or D2 exceeds two inches, then you'll also be hit with a $10 million um, penalty added to your structural efficiency score. Next slide, please. So here's the two equations for construction economy and structural efficiency. Not too much change with construction economy other than uh, what the multipliers are. So you can see construction time times the number of non-barge builders times $120,000 per person per minute. And then the barges are the construction time times the number of barges times $270,000 per person per minute. So you can see the cost of barges, unlike last year, it was double. It's a little more than double this year. And then the the penalty time will be multiplied by $300,000 per minute. Structural efficiencies where a larger change has been made. Um, you can see that the exponent for the measured weight is 2.11, and then that's multiplied by $15 per pound to the 2.11. Penalty weight is multiplied by $3,000 $3, a pound. And then the major change is this gamma lat. So gamma lat's going to be equal to one if your lateral load test sway is greater than half an inch, but less than three quarters of an inch. And it's going to be 
0.95 if the lateral test sway is less than or equal to a half an inch. So this is essentially reducing your aggregate deflection to 95% of the measured value if your lateral stiffness is larger. So it's recognizing the fact that lateral stiffness plays an important role in terms of the vertical behavior of the bridge. And then that's multiplied by $4,250,000 per inch. Next slide, please. So that gives you a kind of a general overview of all the changes for the rules. I did want to talk a little in terms of rules clarifications as well. Next slide, please. So for rules clarifications, keep in mind that questions here should be limited to interpretation of the rules. We're not going to answer questions that are asking, does this connection configuration meet the connection requirement rules? Or does this construction procedure meet uh, the construction roles. We're not going to tell you whether a connection is legal or illegal. What we will do is answer those general, general questions associated with rules associated with connections or construction or anything else associated with the rules. Also, make sure your question is clear because we need to be able to interpret what you write in terms of your connection. The, connect, the questions are submitted through AISC.org backslash SSBC. It typically takes two to three weeks to provide a response, and responses will only be posted on the official Student Steel Bridge Competition Clarifications page um, with AISC. And that's largely so that everybody sees the clarification and responses all at the same time, so no one has an advantage of, of getting that information earlier. And the way to find out when those are posted is to sign up for the email updates. Next slide, please. So the general procedure for clarification requests and what to know if you submit a clarification, you'll typically receive a confirmation email from the rules committee that the clarification was received. This takes one to two weeks. That email will either state that your request is being taken under review, or it may point you to a specific section of the rules that we think answers your question. If that is the case, and then you go to that part of the rules and you're like, I still don't think this answers my question, feel free to resubmit the question with a little more detail and we'll, um, we'll take that under advisement. Now, if we are going to look and take your clarification request under review, what we'll do is we'll develop a clarification question and answer that would be appropriate for posting. This usually takes about one or two weeks because it is reviewed and discussed by the whole rules committee and the final version is needs to be agreed upon by the whole rules committee. Clarification questions and answers also are typically posted in batches, so that may also lead to some delays before you see um, an answer. Next slide, please. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Christy for some additional team resources. All right. Thanks, Jason. And thanks, Javier. So we'll cover just a few more team resources that should um, hopefully help you throughout the competition season. Um, the first thing that I will point you towards is the competitor's guide. So this is a great guide for any teams who may just be getting started for the first time or want a refresher. So there's a, a planning checklist of things to think about kind of throughout you know, the time between now and when you go to your regional competition. Uh, several other resources are listed within that guide. And then uh, what's particularly helpful if you're trying to get familiar with the competition itself is that there's sections dedicated to each of the elements of the competition that Javier walked through earlier in this um, in this call. So you can take a read through that and get a, a clearer picture of, of what to expect on the day of the competition at each of the stations. Uh, we recently released a brand new sustainability guide. This actually just got posted yesterday. So many sustainability principles um, that apply to real life buildings and bridges also could apply to the competition. So while this is not a part of the official scoring for this year's competition, this guide provides some ways that you can consider to incorporate sustainability into your bridge. So things like, you know, thinking about where your steel comes from, maybe using less material, incorporating salvage materials. So maybe if we're using some parts and pieces from previous bridges, um, and then, you know, looking forward and, and planning for adaptability and deconstruction. 
So there's several opportunities for you to tell us about this. Um, so you'll notice, um, you know, the, the optional video award category prompts you to summarize how you emphasize sustainability in your design analysis and fabrication. Um, you can also explain sustainability considerations on your poster. Um, and then if you just simply want to tell us more about it, uh, we'll send a short survey later on um, and you can just tell us, tell us what you did. Uh, for the uh, last several years, we have partnered with NCSEA, which is the National Council of Structural Engineers Associations. Um, they have 44 member organizations that are scattered um, across the country, so in the states that are indicated uh, with the green. And each one of those organizations has a delegate who can help get you in touch with a practicing structural engineer in your area. So if you're looking for a team mentor, maybe someone who can give you some feedback on your design or point you towards, you know, structural analysis software that could be helpful, or just if you're looking to make some connections, um, you can visit the address on the slide to request the contact list and then reach out to the delegate in your area. Um, and then they will help um, get you in um, in contact with someone someone nearby who may be able to help you. So um, don't panic if you are in one of the gray states on this on this map. While there's not necessarily an organization in your state, um, there's still some some ways that you can get in contact with somebody. So there's also the contact information on that spreadsheet for the director of NCSEA, and so he can help um, find you find you someone. So um, I strongly encourage you to to take a look at that. Um, you know, mentors can can provide a, a lot of good feedback um, and also help you make some connections moving forward for your careers. You can also request AISC's assistant with, assistance with getting in uh, partnership and in contact with local fabricators. So AI, AISC has an extensive uh, membership base of, of fabricators all across the country, and um, they may be able to help you in a variety of different ways. Uh, you are encouraged to participate in as much of the fabrication process as possible, so I do want to emphasize that, but, you know, we do recognize that there are some, um, some campuses have, have more or, or less facilities than others, so um, a fabricator could, you know, help you with by donating or, or helping you order materials for your bridge. Um, they can provide some guidance on constructability. Some of them like to sponsor their local team, so they might be able to monetarily contribute towards your team. Um, and then again, they, they may be able to assist you with some fabrication services if you don't, if you don't have those facilities um, on your campus and don't have access to that. So there is a form on the team resources page that you can, um, can complete, and then we will send you a list of fabricators within a um, within close distance, and their their contact information. You can reach out to them directly. We also have a couple of videos that you might find helpful. Um, there's a, a one minute team recruitment video that you can find on the team resources page. This is just a real quick. Um, kind of a hype video, if you will, uh, if you're looking to recruit some new members to join your team. It's just a, a really quick overview and, and you know, helps generate some excitement for, for the competition for people to get involved. And then new this year, we recently also posted a, a more general informational video. So this one's about two minutes long, um, and you can find that on the About page. Uh, this talks a little bit more about the competition and, and targets a variety of audiences. Um, so you, you may find this helpful if you're trying to solicit some sponsors or trying to get some additional support from your university. Um, it, it highlights, you know, the, the benefits for students and, and the benefits of, um, of supporting, you know, this, this type of program. So you feel free to um, access that YouTube video as well. We do have a few faculty members um, on the call. So as a faculty um, advisor for the team, we have several resources for you as well. So there is um, a, a dedicated faculty resources page, and there you'll find a, a faculty advisor guide. This reads kind of like a, it's a, a Q&A guide. So it's just several questions that you may have, um, especially if you are a, a newer faculty member or a new faculty advisor. Um, so just some, some brief, you know, answers to to helping you get started, helping your team get started. So that can be a, a good reference. There's also a one page uh, kind of quick reference sheet of faculty advisor expectations and just what what you can anticipate 
with your role over the coming year. Uh, there's also a safety awareness guide. This is posted both on the faculty resources page and the team resources page. Um, so encourage you to take a look at that, especially if you're um, you know, fabricating and, and doing things on your own campus. And then there's also a, a video presentation about the competition. This was from an educator session several years ago at our annual conference um, with two experienced faculty advisors and, and talking about you know, an overview of the program and, and the impact on students. So that's uh, that recording is also available. And then um, all of the teams, eligible teams who participate in a regional competition um, are eligible for a $750 team stipend. So um, in order to receive this and other sponsor benefits, your team needs to complete a form from AS ASCE. So that's the intent and eligibility form. Um, so this form is provided in the host mailer and we also posted the link on our website. For those of you who are returning um, after previous years with this competition, um, we have transitioned this form to an online format. So there's no more need to print out the PDF and get all the signatures and then rescan the PDF. Um, there's now um, a single form that will need to be completed individually by the team captain, the ASCE student chapter faculty advisor. And then if you have a different faculty advisor for that's dedicated to your SSBC team, who's probably, you know, a primary point of contact there, um, they'll also need to, to complete that form. So it's, it's an acknowledgement form of the eligibility requirements and, and the overall conduct. So uh, get access to that form, make sure everybody fills it out. And then once, once your team has all, has submitted all of those, then, then we'll review and get that, get those stipends sent your way. Um, so a AISC provides the stipends to the checks or stipend checks to the um, the teams in the United States, and then for any of you who are in a Canadian a Canadian school or are down in Mexico, um, those checks will come from ASCE. And the the deadline for that is November fourth. And then once we get your completed information, we will add you to our participating teams map. Um, so this is a map on our website that currently shows where the regional and the national finals competitions are being held. And then um, as you get all signed up for the competition, we will add you to this map and you'll be able to see, um, see a little dot for your school. You can also provide a website link and contact information for your team. So this is completely optional, but if you would like to provide, you know, maybe the, the name and email for your team captain, or maybe you have a, a link to a, to a team website or a sponsorship brochure, you can provide that to us and we will post that alongside this map. So we often use this um, when um, you know, a company or an individual is looking to get connected with schools in their area, or they're just, you know, curious what local teams are participating, we do point them towards this map. So, um, again, you're, you're welcome to submit that. It's completely optional. And there's a link um, that will be available um, on the participation map, as well as the team resources page, if you um, would like to add yourself to the map or add your contact information to the map. But your dot on the map won't show up until we have your completed intent and eligibility forms. And then in a couple weeks on Thursday, October 3rd, we are hosting a software webinar. So Bentley Education is um, one of our software sponsors this year, and they will be providing a half hour webinar on October 3rd. The exact time is still um, being finalized. Um, and they'll give an overview and an introduction to their software um, for loading and analysis. And, it, and it's really catered towards this towards the student steel bridge competition. So um, we will announce the, 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 the time and post that on the, the webinars page ahead of time. So be on the lookout for, for an email from us. But in the meantime, you can mark your calendar. And then similar to this presentation, we will record it and make that recording available. Um, and then Jason mentioned this. Uh, we do have email updates that go out to about, they're specifically about the Student Steel Bridge competition. So um, if you are not already on our email list, uh, we encourage you to get on it. So if you, you can go to the team resources page and down at the bottom, there's an email updates tab. And then on several of the pages on the website, there's also um, a navigation on the right-hand side that says request email updates. So that is the best way to get the most up-to-date information about what's going on. 
we send regular updates usually about once a month or so with you know some reminders and information about the competition uh, links to resources and things like that and then uh, as jason also mentioned when there are new clarifications posted that's the email um, group that that gets that information so again if you're not already on that list uh, please go ahead and and join and, and encourage the rest of your team to get on that list so you can um, not miss out on anything uh, so really just a few next steps to, to recap before we we jump over to questions um, so as I mentioned, uh, be sure to request those email updates. Then start being on the lookout for the first mailer from your host. Um, so that should be coming sometime in October. That'll have more information um, about the location and maybe the general schedule. And then uh, the link to ASCE's form will be in that mailer. Um, you can also find it on our website and on the symposium websites as well. And then be sure to complete the, the ASCE intent and eligibility form by November 4th. That's um, the best way to let us know that you plan to participate. And then that is the best and only way to get your participation stipend. So um, again, make sure that your team captain and your faculty advisor or advisors uh, fill that out. So um, with that, we have a few minutes left and we will uh, jump over to, to a few questions. Um, if you have not done so already, you can use the Q&A um, feature here in Zoom to ask your question and then we'll, we'll go through those as, as time allows. Um, so one of the first questions uh, which we did mention was you know, whether this recording will be available. And yes, it will. We'll we'll get that recording posted by the end of the week, and you can find that on the webinars page. Um, and then also we'll we'll provide the link in the next update email. Um, the next question is um, this is probably for Jason or I guess and Javier. Um, is sustainability considered in any of the scoring this year? So I guess I, I can take that. So sustainability is only explicitly considered in the video award scoring this year, although it can be included as part of the poster. So it could influence your aesthetic score as well. And it could come into play in some of the special awards like the Ingenuity Award or something like that if your team demonstrates that they use sustainability in kind of a different way than would typically be seen. But it's not explicitly in like the construction economy or structural efficiency equations. Great. Um, another question is when will the scoring spreadsheet be available? So AISC will provide the, the official scoring spreadsheet for hosts to use. And that is typically posted um, sometime in February before the competition. But as you know, Javier or as Jason mentioned, you know, all of the equations um, are in the rules. So you're welcome to use those if, if you're trying to weigh different variables as you're doing your design. And I would highly recommend you actually do use those equations to help evaluate your designs. <laughs> Good clarification. <laughs> um, let's see, another, another question for Jason. Um, I'm a new faculty advisor and don't have a structural background. Do you have any advice on how to encourage my team to get the technical support that they need? So the best way to do that is just they can reach out to um, faculty that do have that technical background, or you can utilize some of the resources uh, that Christy had mentioned in terms of reaching out to local fabricators or the local NCSEA, um, and they can usually help out with a lot of this. Also, if um, the team has been established for a while, alumni are also very helpful in terms of being able to walk students through that design process and deal with some of the technical issues that come up during the competition. Jason, can I can I add to that? Yes. Um, well, a pro tip that I have here is that uh, is to build your own templates. There's templates that we're using at the conference to check dimensional um, uh, any any dimensional violations. If you built your own wooden templates and had your own templates, you could check those and make sure that your bridge is within tolerance for, for new teams. That's one thing that I, I see the most is dimensional violations that uh, that really uh, adds weight to their bridge, so it increases their cost. So building their templates is something that, that, that really helps. 
And I guess to follow up on Javier's comment, reminding students, and this is for all the students that are on, on the webinar as well, you don't have to make your tolerances so tight that you're so close to the um, the limits because fabrication is difficult. It's difficult to fabricate things really accurately. So make sure you give yourself a little leeway that that inch probably isn't going to change a whole lot in the overall uh, performance of the bridge. But the penalty will. All right. And then um, last question. We plan to load test our bridge before the competition this year. What percentage of the total load do you recommend with any pre-testing? Do we go to the full load? Javier, you want to take this? I, I think that's a, a great question and there's always a risk reward uh, balance that you have to do as a team if you want to build, if you want to 100% load it. Uh, and it, Kind of depends if you're monitoring deflection or not, but it's it's really up to to the team. Um, I'm I'm hesitant to say any specific number. So, Jason, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I I mean I always encourage teams to fully load test, but when you do fully load test, to make sure that you have additional support so that if there is a failure how catastrophic that failure is, is is minimized and how much you would need to fix if there was a failure. Also having your faculty advisor around during the load test is really helpful because they can often recognize when something is going bad before maybe it gets to the point where um, it's a catastrophic failure. Just make sure you're safe in terms of when you're doing load testing, make sure you follow similar rules to what we would use for competition. All right. Well, that wraps everything up. Um, I think we're over time by just a couple minutes. So um, just want to say thank you again very much to both Jason and Javier for joining us today and then for everybody else on the line. Um, we are, again, very excited for this upcoming competition. Uh, we hope you are too. So um, please do feel free to reach out with questions, whether it's about the rules and directing those to the rules committee, or if you have any other questions about the resources, feel free to get in contact with us at AISC. Um, so with that, we, we wish you a, a great competition and uh, wish you the best of luck as you design and, and fabricate your bridges. And, and we look forward to seeing you in the spring. So have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you.